Well, good morning and happy weekend of worship to you, Central Life Church. If you are joining us outside of this room today, we are so glad you're with us. We have campuses obviously joining us from across our county and from our region, and we have a campus all the way in the heart of our country called the Kingman Extension Campus. And so Come on. why don't you welcome your church family everywhere, all right? Good to be with you today. Man, we're in a series called New right now, and uh, we have been walking into this new year, 2020, uh, examining what does it mean to say yes to God at the invitations that he has presented to us so we can experience the new life that he has for us. And uh, as we've journeyed through that, I hope that you've been helped. I hope that God has spoken to you. Today is uh, not a complete diversion from that, but we have a guest speaker in the house today and at all locations. And uh, I cannot wait for you to hear from him. Uh, his name is Pastor Terrence Mullings. He and his wife, Emma, have come to us by way of Miami, but also uh, previous to that by way of Sydney, Australia. And so they have moved to our great state of Florida, the greatest of all the United States come on, come on. Um, here in the America. And uh, they have decided to plant a life-giving church in Miami this very year, a few months from now. And it is our honor to uh, have him here representing his family, representing the call of God on his life, his family's life. And uh, I want you to know that the longer you're around Central Life, whether that be here at this location or any of them, and even if you join us online and wherever you're coming from and listening to this, if you stick around long enough, you will know that we are a church that believes in church planting. Yeah, and uh, that is what we uh, are, are accomplishing together as a church family. And so it's an honor to, to bring a church planter. Now, he's going to tell you a little bit about his story and his life, but I just want you to know that he is a man who loves Jesus mm -hmm. and seeks to model Jesus in his life and through his family. And uh, we are believing that God is going to do some great things in the, in the coming years through History Makers Church, which will begin, like I said, this year. And, and so let me just tell you this, okay? Let me just tell you this, that Central Life Church is going to come alongside of History Makers to see that they're able to take their very first step as a church out of strength and in great confidence. And so we're going to support them financially. And we're going to support them in prayer. And we're going to support them even by, a few months from now, sending a group of you to their very first day Come as on. a church family. And so that's going to happen. And so with no further ado, I want to turn it over to Pastor Terrence Mullings. Why don't you come, Terrence? Pastor, I love you. Come on, can we just keep that praise going for Jesus here this morning? He's worthy of all of our praise. And I love that we were just singing, praise the name of the Lord, our God. God is here, He's present, and He's not absent. Uh, great to be with you, Central Life. I just love the name of this church. I think it says it all, that when Jesus is at the center, life happens. True life happens when Jesus is at the center. And absolutely adore your pastors, pastors Ryan and Amanda. You are the bomb.com. Let's go. That's what we say in Australia. I hope that actually translates over here. But I just love that you reflect the heart of, uh, of Jesus. You know, the Bible says that we are most like God when we give. You know, because for God so loved the world, He gave. And I just think your generous spirit uh, to welcome us into your world, uh, when I'm sure you've got you know, many people and many friends, but as we've transitioned from Australia, I think uh, just meeting you guys has been such a breath of fresh air. Grateful for your kindness, for your generosity, for modeling the heart of Jesus Christ, just to uh, focus on his mission, which is people, and bringing his presence to his people. So if you're grateful for your pastors, come on, would you just thank God for them here this morning? You are the real deal. Uh, well, as uh, Pastor Ryan said, he does believe in church planters and he's asked me to go for it this morning. So I'm going to do that. Uh, he's asked me to speak with you over the next three hours and... <laughs> Sorry. Was it not three hours that I missed the memo? Uh, over the next 35 minutes. And I want to speak to you from this thought. Faith for a better story. Faith for a better story. Because who knows there is a better story than we're currently living Especially if Jesus is the author of our story, there is faith for a better story. And, and the Bible tells us very clearly how we can step onto the pages of that better story, uh, step off the pages of the old, 
and step onto the pages of the new. And it says that in order for us to do that, we have to stop looking at our circumstances. Uh, we certainly have to start, stop looking at the past, where we've been. Uh, God requires us, uh, the Bible says, we've got to stop looking at other people and, and, then look, and then measuring our story compared to them and actually being disappointed. And in fact, our text this morning, Hebrews 12.2, encourages us that in order to see and step onto the pages that God has for us, we need to look up a little bit and actually look onto Jesus. We look onto Jesus for this reason. He's both the author and the finisher of our stories. Come on, anyone grateful that we serve a God who is faithful to finish the good work that He started in our life? And can I just say this, please, just look in my eyes and hear my heart this morning. If you are not seeing the finished work of Jesus Christ in your life, then He's not finished with you yet. Come on, if you're not seeing the finished work of Jesus in your life, then He's not finished with you yet. You know, I don't know the specific details of your life, of uh, how 2019 went down, or even how 2020 might have started, but I know that we serve a God who has a better story for our life. Uh, you might be at one end of the spectrum where, you know, life is like, you're winning. Come on, baby, you are winning. Yeah. Marriage is good. Health is good. Mental health is strong. But who knows that with Jesus as the author of our story, if he's the author of our story, there's always more grace for the gap. There's always a, the script can read a little bit better. There's grace from where we are and where we want to be. God, there is grace for when, you know, we're driving this morning to church and we're yelling at the kids. How do I know? Because I've done that myself. <laughs> but there is grace. Uh, but you might not be on the end of the spectrum on this end where you're winning. You might look at the story of your life and it might read more like a, a fail. And honestly, and honestly, it feels like someone's stolen the pen out of your hands and started to scribble on the script of your life. And it feels like the devil started to write pain, hurt, disappointment. Maybe there was some great loss in your life of a loved one. But I came here to tell you that the, Jesus is not the author of that story. You know, the Bible tells us who the author of that story is. It's actually found in John 10.10. 10, and it says this in John 10.10, 10, that there is a thief. And he has a purpose and a story for our life. And it's not what God's great story is. The thief comes to steal the pen out of our life. And he wants to write on the story of our life he wants to kill every dream, destroy all sense of hope. But are you grateful that we serve a God who truly is the author of our stories? And he can take what the devil meant for, for bad and actually turn it around for good. I am grateful that we serve a God who is the true author of our story. And where the devil has tried to put a full stop, God says, uh-uh, there is more to the story. We can turn the page and step off the old, step off what is broken and step into the new and step into the blessing. Am I grateful that we serve a God who is faithful to finish? And so I want to talk this morning about the better story, having faith for a better story than we're currently living. Because who knows when Jesus is the author of our story, he says he has a purpose to give us a rich and satisfying life. You know, there's another translation that says that when God writes our story, he, he writes our story with life. Uh, we call that eternal life. That's where our name is written in the book of life. And who knows God doesn't write with pencil. Come on, he's written with his blood. It is a mark that cannot be erased. But not only do we have that eternal life, we have the abundant life. There is abundant life. And I want to speak about that better life that he has for us. And so today I want to help you, help me preach this a little bit. So I want to, uh, for those taking notes and for those who want to go to heaven, <laughs> you'll take some notes now. Someone's taking notes. I would love, by the end of this message, you'd be able to answer two questions. Uh, what chapter of God's story are you currently in? Because I've found in my young 22 years of living, I'm in church, I can't lie, 38, 38 years of living, that the Christian walk is, is less of a step of faith, and it's actually more a walk, a series of steps by faith. It's less of a leap of faith, and it's like, ta-da, I've arrived, but more of a series of lunges. Come on, ladies, work in those buns. There is, there is steps that we need to take. And I'll tell you why I say this, because I find that many times we can get saved as Christians and, and we step onto the chapter of God's story for our life and we get stuck because we think, oh, is that it? 
But I found that there are a series of chapters, and today I want to outline the four chapters of the story that God wants to walk us through off the pages of the old and under the pages of the new. Off the pages of brokenness and under the pages of blessing. And I would love you to be able to answer two questions, and that is, ask the Holy Spirit, what chapter of his story am I currently in? What chapter of his story am I currently in? And do I need to turn the page and step onto a new chapter, a better chapter of your story for my life? Is that okay, those two questions? Let's pray one more time. Father, we just thank you that you are here. We thank you that your presence is here with us, your people, to give us all the power we need to fulfill the great purpose you have for us. Speak to us today, God. Above my voice, we ask that we would hear your voice. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Well, look, just by way of introduction, because I can see some of you looking at me like, I mean, he looks black, but he sounds pretty white. There is a reason for that. The reason is I was actually born of Jamaican parents. Yeah, man. Anyone from Jamaica? (laughs) One person down the back. (laughs) We're off to a great start. I was actually born of Jamaican parents, but uh, I personally was actually born in Brisbane, Australia. I was born in Brisbane, Australia because my dad, uh, being Jamaican, uh, Jamaica part of the British Commonwealth, they were giving scholarships for people to leave uh, Jamaica as a developing nation and study in a first world nation like Australia. And so my dad got one of the few scholarships to study veterinary science in Australia. Uh, I was bo- uh, my sister was born there. Uh, I was born there and we left when I was three months old. After leaving Australia, we moved back to Jamaica where we lived for six years, uh, which is nice. Uh, After Jamaica, we actually moved here to the best state in the world. Come on, to Florida. Uh, Even better, South Florida. (laughs) Moved to Florida uh, where we lived for two years. And after that, we moved all the way back to Australia. And uh, I mean, we lived in so many different places. Uh, We lived in a place called Brisbane. Then we moved to Sydney. Then we moved to a place called Deniloquin, uh, which I won't ask you if you've heard of Deniloquin because uh, there was only 10,000 people there and uh, we were the only black family. Uh, so needless to say, growing up, I was a standout. <laughs> and that was fun. After Deniloquin, we moved to a place called Wagga Wagga. Yeah. So good they had to name it twice. <laughs> it was really not that great. But uh, you could go and check out Wagga Wagga. Uh, After Wagga, we actually moved to, uh, I moved and left home, went to university in Sydney, where I met my beautiful, stunning, darling wife. Come on, her name is Emma Mulling. She's my Angelina Jolie lookalike with the heart of Mother Teresa and the wisdom of Joyce Meyer. Uh, Gentlemen, we call that scoring. I scored. Actually, do we have a picture of my family? Can we pop that up? There is my beautiful family. Come on. I heard one man say, yeah, no, no, she's taken. (laughs) Uh, I'm so blessed. That is my daughter, Hosanna Emma Gracia. She's 10, uh, a gift from heaven. Jeremiah Maxwell Joshua, who's nine. We've got Israel, who's two. I pray for us. uh, She's got so much energy. Israel, Charlotte Hope, and little Kingston, Jesse Moses, who is one. And, uh, you know, life is fabulous and fun with four kids, but if you really want to know what it's like, just imagine getting the, your favorite ingredients for a smoothie, okay? And you pop them all into the blender and someone turns it on and forgets to put the lid on. It's wild and it's wacky, but it's awesome. And it's nice and, uh, you know, my beautiful family. Now we've actually come full circle and we moved here, as Pastor Ryan said, uh, 11 months ago and landed here in South Florida. And uh, we just it's been such a delight here. We answered the call of God, sold everything, and moved here to plant History Makers Church. Yes. Let's go. Uh, Historymakers.church. Uh, shameless plug. <laughs> shameless plug. <laughs> but we're so excited to uh, love on Florida uh, alongside you guys. And, you know, growing up and living in all these different places has been fun. And it's actually been fun. I remember growing up in Jamaica. You know when you move to a place and you're the, um, the, the new person, you can kind of, you know, tell them your nickname. So I told people, mate, my name's Terrence and I'm the thunder from down under. That's what I told them my name was. I was interested in growing up here in America because they'd look at me like some of you are still looking at me like, what? A black guy from Australia? Oh, snap. It's an Aborigine. No, they're my people that are originally from Jamaica. And look, it's been fun being different and living in all these different places uh, because who knows variety is the spice of life. Come on. 
He really is. But there did come a point in my life where I had to ask God, why is it that I'm always different? Why is it that I don't seem to fully fit in, even in the story of my own life? And I know in a room like this, there'd be many of us for a variety of reasons who feel like we don't fit in the script of our life, whether it's because uh, your gender in a male-dominated world, uh, whether it's your race, your age, your culture, your ethnicity, your socioeconomics, too much money, not enough money. Uh, and the devil will try and tell us reasons why our difference is somehow deviant. But I came here this morning to tell you that your difference is actually divine. Come on, your difference is from God because he's placed a part of his story inside of you that the world needs. And you know, personally, I actually went to God because who knows that if we want to find out about the story of our life, it's great to go to the author. So I did. I went to uh, the author and I and, uh, and, uh, was searching for God and he spoke to me through the life of Moses. Now, I love the story of Moses, and most of you know the story of Moses. Uh, he was this young boy who was born at a time when his people, the Israelites, he was a Hebrew boy, uh, when the Israelites were being enslaved by the Egyptians. Now, at the time Moses was born, the, the Egyptians were led by this guy called Pharaoh. Awful, evil, totalitarian ruler. I mean, someone you would not like to meet. And, and he was enslaving uh, God's people and using them as slave labor to build cities and to build monuments under his self. And this is the predicament that Moses was born into. And so when Moses was born, Pharaoh put out this edict because he heard there was going to be a little boy that was going to be born that was going to emancipate the people, which would mean he would lose his slave labor. And so he puts out this edict to kill every child to actually get them and throw them in the river Nile to drown them. Or he actually asked the midwives to take them out just as they were coming out of the womb. Evil. And so this is what Moses was born to. And as I was reading that, I'm thinking, isn't it amazing that Moses was born into this and he hasn't actually even done anything, but yet someone's trying to take his life. I don't know about you, but have you ever looked at the story of your life and wondered, why all this drama, God? Why all this attack going on in my life? I haven't even done anything. And can I say to you this morning that maybe sometimes the sign of the attack is actually a sign that you're on track. Sometimes the sign of the attack is a sign that you're on track. Why? Because you see, the devil can read your story, but he can't write your story. And so the devil could see that this, this young boy was going to grow up and actually emancipate God's people and set them free. And so he tried to take him out in his infancy, in his juvenile. And I believe that many of us here, you know, the devil tried the same thing with Jesus. When, when King Herod heard Jesus was going to be born, he also put out an edict to kill every child under the age of two. Because he knew that if the, if the baby could grow up and get through those initial stages, the baby, that son, would become all that he was created to be. And I'm telling you, if some of you have been under attack in your life, in your marriage, uh, at work, and in your ministry, and the sign of that attack is a sign you're on track. Because the devil can see your story, and he can read your story, but he can't write your story. But are you grateful that we serve a God who is the author of our stories, and he can take everything the devil meant for evil, and he can turn it around for our good. Come on, I'm so grateful about that. And so Moses uh, grows up in this predicament where he's under attack straight away. But I love his mother, Jochebed. The Bible says that she was a woman of faith. And the Bible says that she hid Moses until he was three months old. You know what I love about that? Because, you know, it's not just necessarily about reading the Bible, but allowing the Bible to read you. Because when you do, it actually speaks to the very specifics of your situation. So I'm reading that and, you know, Moses had to leave his home when he was three months old. I left my home when I was three months old. Australia, we left Australia when I was three months old. So immediately God's got my attention. And so Moses floats down the River Nile and he floats past the, the crocodiles, the emus, the ostriches. I mean, it was an Australian river, come on. <laughs> With all this stuff that would kill him. He floats down, sees little Nemo. Hi, Nemo. It's funnier in my head, but thank you for obliging the laugh. <laughs> he floats down. And, and, you know, I saw something in that story uh, as I was reading, even recently, another thought that I never saw before because Moses was in the River Nile in the very place where the king was trying to kill little babies. And I don't know if you found yourself in a part of your story where you're looking at it and you're like, God, are you authoring this story? Are you really authoring this story? Because it doesn't look like you are. And I found myself there in April just last year. We just moved here from Australia to South Florida. And uh, my dad sends me a text and says, 
mum just died. Now, she wasn't sick. There was actually nothing wrong, but she just passed away suddenly. And man, I, I don't know about you, but you can't really prepare yourself for something like that, someone you love dying like that. And it, it, was a, it, was a, it, it did hurt, but God really showed me through the life of Moses that when it looks like on the surface, the devil trying to destroy you, it actually could be God trying to deliver you into the destiny and the destination he has for you. And he showed me through the life of Moses, because watch this, Moses is in the river Nile, but I want to ask you, who put Moses there? Who put Moses there? It wasn't actually Pharaoh who was trying to destroy him, it was his mother who loved him. Why? Because now Moses now floats down the river Nile and he's found by Pharaoh's daughter. So the same one who was trying to destroy him, the same one who was trying to kill him, now has to pay for his education, now has to raise him, train him to think like a king so that Moses can grow up one day and steal the kingdom and steal the throne and set God's people free. I am so thankful that we serve a God who was able to flip the script and take everything the devil meant for evil and turn it around for my good and for your good. Are you grateful about that this morning? That is the God that we serve. And I love Moses' story because now he grows up in the privilege of the palace. Pharaoh has to pay for his education. We know there was something different about Moses. Moses actually knew there was something different about him. God had a better story for him than he was currently living. And so he chooses to step off the pages of privilege and actually identify with his own people, the Bible says, as it retells the story in Hebrews. And one day he sees one of his fellow Israelites being beaten by an Egyptian and he ends up killing the Egyptian, which is a big mistake because now Moses has to retreat to the backside of the desert to this place called Midian. Now we know Moses doesn't fit in the script of his life in Midian either. Why? Because he has a child and calls him Gershom. Now, first mistake there is naming a kid Gershom. (laughs) We've got four of them. That was not one of the names that was on the baby name list. And the reason is this, because the name Gershom means I've become a foreigner in a foreign land. You know, why is it Moses couldn't seem to fit in with the script of his story in any way? He couldn't fit in with his own people over here. Why? Because he grew up in the privilege of the palace. So what would he know about their struggles? And come on, the struggle's real. At the same time, he couldn't fit in with the people over here who raised him. Why? Because to them, he was just a slave by birth and blood. And as I look at the story of Moses, I realize the reason that Moses couldn't fit in in the story of his own life and live the better story that God had for him is that Moses was trying to define his difference. He was trying to define his story disconnected from the author of creation. And see, when we try to write our own stories disconnected from the author, it's always going to be disappointing and will always dilute the greatness that God has for us. But it's only when Moses, see Moses, when he was trying to write his own story, he said, I'm going to be a defender of my people. And he goes to their defense and he messes it all up. But it's only once he connects with the author of creation here in the burning bush moment in Midian that God could actually lift his vision to look higher and see that God had called him for so much more. And God reminds Moses, I never called you just to be a defender of a person. Uh Uh-uh. I called you to be a deliverer of a nation. And maybe this service right here this Sunday morning at Central Life is your burning bush moment where you can reconnect with the author of creation and he can lift your vision and tell you who you truly are. Come on, that you're a world changer, that you're a history maker, that if the way maker lives inside of you, there is always a way out. From the old story, from the broken story, from the difficult times, God can lift your vision and take you to a new story, to a better story. Come on, let's give God five seconds of praise in here. He is worthy and he's the great author who is faithful to finish the good work that he started in you and in me. You know, for me personally, I had my burning bush moment like Moses uh, where I connect, reconnected with the author of creation back in October, November 2014. And I went on a 40-day fast because I really needed to get clarity from God about whether he was calling us to plant a church here in Florida. Uh, because there was options in Australia, we could have planted a campus there. Uh, my wife, Emma, is a pastor's kid, and her dad actually had a church in Queensland that he wanted us to take over. And so uh, we went on a 40-day fast. And, you know, it's amazing. Can I just say, during that 40-day fast, God gave me the blueprint in those 40 days 
for the next 40 years. In those 40 days, I got the blueprint for the next 40 years. And you know, God showed me so many wonderful things. That are, One of the great things that God showed me is that certain things have to die in the wilderness or they'll kill you in the promised land. And you know, a lot of us are just coming out of this fast right now as a church, and I believe that God's letting certain things die, certain mindsets, certain habits that actually are not helpful, but they're harmful. And as you let those things go during the fast, you're pressing pause on the natural so you can press play on the spiritual. And I believe you're going to hear God's voice, and maybe you haven't fasted, you don't need to do 40 days, sometimes just one meal. Just maybe just take it, because when you, when you do that, you'll hear things from heaven that will set you up. And you know, during that, that 40 days, God made it really clear to me that every time God encounters man, every time that our humanity, humanity encounters his divinity, it actually follows these four chapters of the story. You know, I could show you all through, from Genesis through to Revelation, how every time God encounters that he takes us through this journey, of, and, and it follows these four chapters. And I'm going to outline them really quickly. Uh, as you're taking notes, because you do want to go to heaven, the four chapters of the story that God will walk you through, uh, and you see it in Moses' life, is that the chapter one is where he will discover you. Moses was discovered in the River Nile. Moses was discovered in a very destitute place. You know, you might have come in here this morning feeling God doesn't see me, but can I just say that God sees you. He sees you and he knows you. And he can find you no matter where you are in the most challenging situations, God will discover you. Once he discovers you, chapter one, he will then develop you. He will develop you. Uh, sometimes that development stage is challenging. Like Moses, he was developed behind enemy lines. Uh, developed amongst a people who really didn't know or value him. When the family who loved him was over here, the Israelites, God will develop you sometimes in a challenging place. But don't stop because he's forming the image of Jesus in you and me. Once he develops you, then he'll start to define you. He'll define you, you know, not by your circumstances, but actually by an encounter with the Holy Spirit. Like Moses had this encounter in Midian with God where God lifted his vision and showed him who he truly is. And once he defines you, then chapter four of your story, he will deploy you to go out into the world. Like he said to Moses, you know, I'm sending you back. They were the words God said to me when we called us to South Florida. You know, all, all of the places I'm sending you back because I've seen the oppression of my people. I've heard them crying out for help and I'm not leaving them alone. I'm going to act, but I inv he invites Moses onto the pages of his story and they go on this great commission where God says, my presence is going to go with you. And can I just say with some of you, as you go out, you need to know that you're not being deployed alone. You're being deployed with all of heaven's resources on your side and his presence is going to go with you and that will actually bring you rest. Peace will come. Uh, I want to quickly look at uh, another uh, encounter I can show you. Man, I won't go through the, uh, the verse uh, for the screens team in, in uh, Genesis. I'm going to go straight to the encounter that Jesus has with the disciples, where he asked them to step out of the old as fishermen and step onto the new of fishing for men. And what I love about that is that Jesus goes up to these disciples and he says 11 words. How many words? 11 words. And they would leave everything. Their income as fishermen, their identity as fishermen, their, their inheritance, what was going to be left for them, and the influence they had on just those 11 words. Now, these were leaders of their day. In an agrarian age, leaders would leave everything. And I believe in those 11 words, we see the four chapters again of the story that God wants to walk us through. But don't click out now. Hear me. Please, ask the Holy Spirit as I outline these again, what chapter of his story are you currently in? You know, chapter one is where he will discover you. He will discover you. God actually said, Jesus said to the disciples, come, come. In that first word, come, we see that, you know, I can only call you if I discover you. And he calls us, you know, let me illustrate it this way. Uh, I, I had a Jamaican father. And my Jamaican father, when we lived in Wagga Wagga, would actually, uh, we were blessed to have a beautiful home, three-story home. Uh, Dad would stand upstairs in his, in, his three, up in his room, and I'd be downstairs. I was a musician, uh, had my headphones on, writing music, and he would call me, Terrence, Terrence, <laughs> Jamaican father. Come here, man, come here. So I'd run upstairs because my dad's calling me. You know what I'd get upstairs and see my dad doing? Firstly, I've got to say that I'm convinced that Jamaican parents, maybe some Hispanic parents have children for one reason only. 
and that is slave labor. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. Because I got upstairs and my Jamaican father is sitting on his bed. You know what he asked me to do? To pass his slippers that were three steps away. Really, Dad? And I remember one time he was calling me, and I didn't know he was calling me. The only reason I found out he was calling me is because he walks downstairs, had my headphones on, writing some music. He knocks the headphones off my ears and says, listen, I was calling you. It's why you're not answering me. I said, just relax, Dad. I didn't hear you. Him say, you not hear me? Even if you don't hear me, you must answer me. I am your father. Really? And then he goes on to say, I said, Dad, can you just chill? You click your fingers at your father. You, had the, you must have the same father. Because he looks at me and says, listen, boy, I brought you into this world and I can take you out. But wait. Then he said, me and your mother will make another one that looks just like you and nobody would know. Come on, baby. That is Jamaican Parenting 101. I don't recommend it, but it does work. Look, it might be a slight exaggeration of how the story went down, but it was close to the truth. It really was close to the truth. You see, my father was calling me. Why didn't I answer? I didn't answer because I was too busy doing something I thought was more important than answering the father's call. And I wonder how many of us are here this morning busy pursuing the call, pursuing the dream, pursuing this, that we're too busy to answer the call of our Father in heaven. But if you're here this morning and you've never answered the call, you know your Father is calling you. He's calling you close. He's calling you into relationship. He's calling you out of the old and into the new. A new life, a better life where there's peace, where there's joy, where there's forgiveness. And if you've never answered that call, in nine minutes, I'm going to give you an opportunity to answer that call, to step off the pages of the old story and actually to step onto the pages of his incredible story for your life. Would you answer that call? You know, chapter one of our stories where God discovers us. Once he discovers you, then he moves you into chapter two of your story where he will start to develop you. Everyone say develop. Develop, develop you. You know, Jesus says, come, chapter one. Chapter two, he says, follow me. I want to ask you who you're following. Now, I'm not talking about Instagram and Facebook, uh, but if Jesus was on Instagram, would you, do you actually read the comments? Are you reading his word? Uh, I once heard it said like this, uh, you are the, we are the sum total of the five closest people in our life. Now, for some of us, it's a very awesome thought. It's a very... Awesome thought because when I look at people like Pastor Ryan Alonzo, in my circle, I feel that my future's good. But for some of us, it's not a very awesome thought. It's a very confronting thought. Because every time that you feel discouraged, every time that you give up on your dreams, every time that you feel dis disappointed, it, you're hanging around those people. But maybe this Sunday, God is asking you to disconnect from them so you can start to truly follow him. Come on, maybe he's asking you to actually literally unfollow some people who are discouraging, who are negative, and, and not, not that you don't love them, but sometimes you've got to distance yourself from them so you can actually follow Jesus into the future that he has for you. Let me illustrate it this way. Uh, I'm going to tell you something which is very evident. Uh, because we're in central life and there's a million campuses all over the world, uh, you may not be able to see this uh, online, but I work out. I know you should have known that. I actually, uh, I, I wanted to go to the gym with uh, Pastor Ryan, but he skips leg day, so. <laughs> That's so naughty. That's so mean. You don't. You're awesome. <laughs> I actually go to the gym with my two friends. I go to the gym with Des and Troy. This is Des. This is Troy. And together, they destroy. <laughs> oh, Yeah. See, hey, I don't have four children for no reason. My wife loves those jokes, and you are welcome. Here's the thing. I'll tell you why, because here's the thing about exercising and working out. Many people think that to develop big, strong muscles, it's all about lifting heavy weights, just grinding, grinding. And you know, that's partly true. But the truth is, muscle is actually not developed necessarily in the lifting stage. Muscle is developed in the letting go stage. What do I mean by that? In the lifting stage, we break the muscle fibers, and so they disconnect, but it's actually in the letting go, the resting stage, that the muscle fibers form new connections that are bigger, 
better, healthier, and stronger. And I wonder what you need to disconnect from so that God can actually develop some new relationships, some new mindsets, some new habits to make you, form you, and develop you into the image of Jesus Christ. You know, the development stage can actually be very challenging. And I'll tell you why. Because God, Jesus, will actually ask us to forgive some people who are unforgivable. And can I just say, I know that what they did was wrong. I know that they hurt you. And I know that for some of us, you know, we were touched in a way that made us grow up way too early. But God is saying, when we carry that unforgiveness, when we carry that hurt, what it actually does, it actually puts us under a burden that we weren't created to carry. But there is so much forgiveness in heaven. The way that God has forgiven us, if we would just measure that to other people and let them go, it's actually not a gift we're giving to them. It's a gift we give to ourselves. And I'm telling you, when we forgive, we will find a freedom, we'll find a joy, and we'll find a life that we can only dream of. Anyone grateful that God is a God who is abundant in forgiveness for you and for me and for all others? You see, God's developing you. Just don't give up yet. Just a few more reps of that forgiveness, a few more laps on a treadmill of generosity, and we'll find that we're formed in the image of our Creator. So Jesus says, come, follow me, do what I do, forgive who I forgive, let it go, so that I will make you. The third chapter of your story you might find yourself in is that not discovery, uh, not the development, but actually the defining stage. You know, they say that, 85% of Christians get stuck in this chapter because we understand chapter one, that's called salvation. That's where God discovers us and calls us out of the old into the new life. We understand chapter two, that's development. That's where we start to get around people who will actually encourage us in the word of God, disconnect from the destructive ones and actually find a great small group, a great connect group. And can I just say, if you haven't found one of those great groups here at Central Life, this is a place where you'll find true life, where you can take the mask off. Some of my greatest friends that have helped me propel into the future, I found in a small group. But chapter three is where Jesus says, come, follow me. I will make you. You know God wants to make you. He wants to make you better. I think for a lot of us, we understand that God wants to make the world. He wants to build the church, but we don't think that God wants to make us. Uh, Let me illustrate it this way. Can I just get a bottle of water there, Pastor Ryan, please? Awesome. Thank you. Come on. Great, good water from near Australia. Fiji water, baby. (laughs) Hope we get a sponsorship from this. So what I have in my hand is a bottle of water. If I, if I take the lid off and I pour out the water and I fill it with orange juice, it's now a bottle off. Come on, talk to me. Bottle off? Yes. If I dip out the orange juice and I fill it with Coca-Cola, it's now a bottle off. Coca-Cola, or some would say poison. <laughs> choose, choose, choose whichever one. What's the point? What's inside the bottle is actually what defines the bottle. And can I just say here this morning, what... In fact, who is inside of you is actually what defines you. You're not defined by your past. You're not defined by the mistakes you made 20 years ago, maybe two days ago. You're defined by the fact that Jesus has paid the ultimate price and died on the cross for you and me so that we can be filled with the Holy Spirit. Come on, aren't we grateful that we serve a God who fills us, who calls us, who knows us by name? You see, this, this, this is chapter of our story is where we've got to realize that there's gifts and talents inside of you. When the Holy Spirit fills you, He actually energizes you, makes you come alive. You know, I'm sure you've heard it said by Pastor Ryan that there's two great days in our life. The day we're born and the day you discover why. And you discover why when the Holy Spirit comes and He defines you. Like Moses, it might be a burning bush moment. But God starts to define you and say, hey, this is who you are. And this is what I've called you to do. You know, if you've never discovered that, there is a great growth track. Is that what you call it here? A great growth track where as a church, we want to just make sure that you can discover, hey, how has God wired me to win in life? If you don't know why God has put you here on this planet, I encourage you to go through that because it'll help you discover there's gifts inside of you that your work needs, that'll help you in marriage, that would help you in relationships to win. See, once you discover God defining you, You step onto the final chapter of the story. And the final chapter is where he deploys you. He discovers you, develops you, defines you. And the final thing, he'll deploy you. Uh, It says, when Jesus calls the disciples, the four chapters, come, follow me, 
I will make you fishers of men. You know, as I was reading that, I was a little bit thinking, okay, there were fishermen. Are you really calling them fishermen again? No, no, no. What God was calling them, he was lifting them on a higher level, not just fishing for fish, but now fishing for people. And you know, God's called each and every one of us because he wants to deploy you to go back out into your sphere of influence to not just make a significant difference, but to make an eternal difference. You know, when, when, when they called the, the fishermen, that's what he said. You know, I reckon, hear this. When God called the tax collector, I reckon he would have said it like this. You know, you've been reconciling the books to make sure no money is missing from the government. Now, I want you to reconcile the book of life to make sure no person is missing from my book. Come on, when God calls us, he calls us to a higher level. When God called me, I was working in television, telling any old vision. But he said, don't just tell any old story, tell his story. Tell my story. And I believe that God is raising up a generation of people that he wants to commission to go out in the world, to go out into real estate, to show people what it looks like when God operates with integrity. And I honestly believe that there is people in here who are going to get God ideas of how to do real estate in such a way that will unlock the block for so many people who can't get homes as Christians. And those homes will actually become places of healing, places of hope and healing where people come and young people can get off drugs because they find there's a God who can lift them higher than any drug can lift them. I believe that there's homes, come on, those homes are going to be places of healing where people who are about to give up on their marriages no longer give up because there's fine, there's restoration, there is hope and there's healing. I really believe that. I believe that there is a spirit of God who is real. And when he deploys you, he says, here's the thing. You know, I'm not sending you out alone. But it's a, not a mission, it is a commission. Now we're sent with the power of the Holy Spirit. Now we're sent with the Spirit of God, with the authority that comes from the name of Jesus, but the power that comes from the Holy Spirit working with us. And we'll go into destitute situations and we're going to bring life where there is lifelessness. We're going to bring hope where there is no hope. Come on, God has saved us so we can bring salvation into this world. Come on, anyone grateful that He's chosen me and you to be the answer, to be the solution? That the world needs. So a simple message. I want to ask you, what chapter of his story are you currently in? Are you in chapter two? Where God is developing you. Things are tough. It, it's tough. But God, you know, can I just say this? You, what you think is breaking you is actually making you. He's developing his image in you. Don't stop. Don't stop. But if you're in that chapter of your story, find a great group of people who can help you become better. Iron sharpening iron. Who would say they're in that chapter of their story? Just by a show of hands. Awesome. Uh, who would say they're in chapter three of your story? Where you, you know, God's developing you. The circumstances don't mean you're bad. God's making you, but he's giving you clarity. Oh, this is who I am. That I'm not really sure, but I just wanted to get the definition that I'm not just a defender. No, no, I'm a deliverer. Who would say that they need to just get some clarity on that call of what God's calling? Awesome. Uh, but who would say that they've, they understand that they've walked through the chapters and that God is definitely deploying them, that he's sent them out. He know, you know that you're not going alone and you'll go back into the same. Hey, can I say this? You'll go back into the same marriage. That won't be different. You'll go back into the same workplace. That's not different, but you're different. Yes. Now you have Christ inside of you and that is the answer that you need and the answer that we all, the world needs. And, and I want to say this, it's, it's not just, it's, it's not always linear. Sometimes you'll find in your Christian journey that you'll be rediscovering God, redeveloping in His image, and we'll consistently grow as we get higher to become more like Him. But I said at the start, maybe, you know, you, 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 when you're reading a book, who knows you can't read chapter 4. If you read chapter 4 but you skip chapter 1, the story is not going to make sense. And, and I believe for some of us here this morning, you've been looking at the story of your life and it's not making sense. The script is not as you expected. But can I just say that maybe you've actually taken the pen out of God's hands and you've tried to write your own story. You know, this morning, God wants to rewrite your story. And if you've never accepted Jesus, he's calling you. The Father is calling you here back in a relationship with him. You can't take chapter four, three, two, unless you take chapter one. And if you're here this morning, you've never accepted Jesus Christ in your life, to invite you off the pages of the old and under the pages of the new, there is an invitation here this morning to do that. God is calling you back in a relationship. And you, can I just say, you know, you know how God writes his story? 
God writes his story with words. When he created the heavens and the earth, he said, let there be light. And what he spoke, we saw. You know that we, it made in the image of God, are actually created to do the same thing. The Bible says in Psalms, I love one of my favorite verses, it says that my tongue, what I use to communicate, is actually also used to create. And that you can rewrite your story here today with your words. And the Bible says if we believe in our heart and we confess with our mouth, we shall be saved. So if you're here this morning, you've never accepted Jesus, we're going to pray a very simple prayer. It's a prayer of invitation where we accept the invitation from God to become his child, his son, and his daughter. And I encourage you to pray that we're going to say this together. And maybe you actually did once walk with God, but you took the pen out of his hands and tried to write your story. Today, there is a rewrite. There is a rewrite. Let's all close our eyes here. Let's say this together. Let's say, dear God, thank you for the invitation to walk into a better story. Thank you for sending Jesus to forgive me of my sins. Today, I follow you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and make me more like you. Today, I am saved in Jesus' name. Come on, can we just give a big shout of praise to Jesus? Come on here, he's rewriting stories and rerouting our destinies. Father, I just thank you for each person here. I thank you that it is a new day. I thank you that it is a new day for us to step off the page of the old and step onto the pages of the new. Why? Because we serve a God who is faithful to finish the good work that he started in you. And I want to say this prophetically. I believe that there's people in this room that you've been believing God for a promise and you haven't seen the promise fulfilled yet. And as I was praying, I really believe that there's people actually, people who have been believing God for a physical baby, an actual baby. And you know, the Bible says in Hebrews 11, 11, that Sarah, although she was ch past childbearing age, she was able to have a child. Why? Because she considered the one who promised faithful. And I don't know what your story is, whether the barrenness is in you as a male or the barrenness is in you as a female. But I believe that the Spirit of God is here this morning and He wants to break the barrenness and you will conceive and you will carry to full term. And I'm believing there's people here who are believing symbolically for a dream in your life that God has something for you. Come on, as we stand here right now and we just lift our hands to heaven as a sign of surrender, Father, I just thank you that you're the God who breaks the barrenness, that you're the God who opens heaven, that you're the God who gives us the invitation to step off the pages of the old and step onto the pages of the new. I thank you for incredible stories of us conceiving dreams, of conceiving what you have for us. And I declare of your people that we will carry it to full term and become all that you created us to be. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Come on, why don't you give him one more shout of praise here this morning.